them into the record. Without Thank objection. You. Okay. Ms. Coyar. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, thank you for holding this important meeting. And I um, also am disappointed that they couldn't send somebody. Uh, I know they could have sent somebody. I'm sure they have a higher upper that could have come here at least to at least be up here and give limited testimony. I um, strongly uh, disagree when, when an agency does that, when uh, the legislators are, are, are calling for oversight and they don't even have the courtesy of sending somebody at least to provide some limited uh, information. I hope that when that arises in the future, we could huddle it up a little bit before and talk about some steps we could take to make sure that it doesn't happen again. I'm sure they're going to send somebody next time, but there's always somebody that they can send, even if it's on a limited testimony. Uh, I, well uh, noted, Mr. Cuellar. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, the, uh, this is an important meeting because I think, as the members have said, you know, the, uh, this procurement has become very complex. Uh, has become very um, uh, costly. Uh, when you look at the services part of it, there's always a question is, you know, what is government supposed to be doing? What's the private sector? Who's doing what? I think it's about, what, 60 percent of the procurement might be in services. So there's a lot of questions. But one of the things that we certainly uh, like to see is what SARA, uh, at the Acquisition Advisory Board, and I think GAO have also come up with significant policy recommendations. and. I'm one of those that I don't like to see reports, but if there's some good recommendations, I hope that we can, uh, we can uh, implement, help implement some of those recommendations, because I know the GAO and the other folks do a lot of work. Uh, uh, some of those recommendations might not work, but I know a lot of them are good recommendations, and I hope we can have a follow-up on some recommendations on that. But otherwise, Madam Chair, I appreciate all the work that you're doing. I, I just want to <clears throat> explain to the members and uh, this is the beginning of a series on hearings, on competitiveness, procurement, et cetera. It is a broad span of information through all the agencies and departments of government. This is just the beginning. But we do hope to gather enough information where we can make recommendations to the full committee to set up a policy standards by which uh, each department must follow. And uh, I can't emphasize enough, this is just the beginning of a series of hearings. We will we'll notify you in plenty of time when we have our next hearing, and I do appreciate the members that are here. If there are no additional opening statements, I see no other members from either side. The subcommittee will now receive testimony from the witnesses before us today. We will now turn to our first panel, and it is the policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify, and I'd like to ask you both to please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Okay. Let it reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Thank you. I'll now introduce our panel. Mr. Shea Assad is the Acting Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition and Technology at the Department of Defense. There, he is responsible for all acquisition and procurement policy matters, including acquisition and procurement strategies for all major weapon systems programs, major automotive information system programs, and services acquisitions. Welcome. Mr. David Drapkin is the Acting Chief Acquisition Officer at the General Services Administration he is responsible for uh, developing and reviewing acquisition policies, procedures, and related training for the GSA and federal acquisition professionals through the Federal Acquisition Institute, Civilian Acquisition Advisory Committee, Federal Acquisition Regulation, and GAO's acquisition material and training programs. I ask that each of the witnesses uh, now give a brief summary of your testimony 
and to keep this summary under five minutes in duration if possible. Your complete written statement will be included in the hearing record. So, Mr. Assad, please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, uh, Ranking Member Bill Bray, members of the subcommittee, uh, my name is Shea Assad. I'm the Director of Defense Procurement, and I also serve as the Acting Deputy Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition and Technology. Thank you very much for providing me the opportunity to uh, participate in this hearing today. In January of 2007, I testified before the Readiness and Management Subcommittee of the Senate Armed Services Committee. At that hearing, I was asked to comment on the then recently completed work of the, the SARA panel or the Acquisition Advisory Panel authorized by Section 1423 of the Service Acquisition Reform Act of 2003. At that time, I testified that I agreed with most of the panel's recommendations and that we would be busy addressing the recommendations of their report. Today's hearing provides an excellent opportunity to provide an account of where we are with respect to the panel's recommendations and how we will move forward in light of the present circumstances. In fact, the Congress has taken up many of the panel's recommendations, adopted into law via the National Defense Authorization Acts of 2008 and 9. The panel's thoughtful report continues to provide a framework for improvement and to inform ongoing initiatives related to commercial practices, performance-based acquisition, small business utilization, the acquisition workforce, and the role of support contractors in the use of federal procurement data. On April 6, 2009, the Secretary of Defense announced his intention to significantly improve the capability and capacity of the defense acquisition workforce by increasing the size of the workforce by 20,000 employees through fiscal year 2015. This will restore the, the organic acquisition workforce to its approximate 1998 levels of 140 people and address long-standing shortfalls in the defense acquisition workforce. It is the first significant growth since the military buildup in the 1980s and the downsizing that occurred during the 1990s. The Secretary's initiative is the overarching human capital strategy to, vitalize, to revitalize the acquisition workforce. The Department's growth strategy directly supports the President's March 4, 2009 memorandum's objective to ensure that the acquisition workforce has the capacity and the ability to develop, manage, and oversee acquisitions appropriately. The defense acquisition workforce is critical for improving acquisition outcomes for the nation's $1.6 trillion investment in major weapons systems. The objective is straightforward, to ensure DOD has the right acquisition capability and capacity to produce the best value for the American taxpayer and for the soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines who depend on weapons and products and services that we buy. Additionally, as you all know, the Department is aggressively pursuing major reforms to our acquisition system. These efforts have been given a high priority by President Obama and Secretary Gates and have recently been complemented by the strong bipartisan commitment to reform uh, registered by Congress via the Weapons Systems Acquisition Reform Act. Let me take a moment to mention some of the reforms that both the Secretary and Deputy Secretary Lynn have articulated. First, to improve the discipline of the acquisition process, each major program will be subject to a mandatory process entry point, the material development decision prior to milestone A. This will ensure that programs are based on approved recruitment of alternatives. To reduce technical risk, we'll refine program requirements and, in re and inform our cost estimates. Our practice will be to conduct competitive prototyping and complete pre preliminary design reviews before we enter milestone B, engineering management and development. We will employ independent technical reviews to certify the majority of pro pro program technologies before we will permit a program to progress to the costly phases of development. And finally, we will complete independent cost estimates at each decision point in the acquisition process to ensure programs are adequately funded and to reduce the risk of costs spiraling out of control. To align profitability with performance, we have taken up several initiatives. Contract fee structures will be tied to contractor performance. We will eliminate the use of unpriced contractual actions whenever possible, and we will ensure that the use of multi-year contracts is limited to circumstances when real, substantial savings are accrued to the taxpayer. 
To prevent programs for ballooning in cost and stretching in schedule, we will use more fixed price development contracts. We will also institute new mechanisms to prevent endless requirements creep in which the desire for an ever-elusive perfect system can result in no system being delivered at all. Of course, none of these reforms will work unless we are prepared to reform or cancel weapons programs that are not on track to provide our warfighters what they need, when they need it, at a fair and reasonable price to our taxpayers. Those hard decisions are reflected in the proposed budget for next year. In summary, the Department is, is determined to improve the effectiveness of our overall acquisition system. As Secretary Gates and Deputy Secretary, being tough-minded on acquisition reform is part of being serious about a strong defense. Every dollar we save through acquisition reform is another dollar we can devote to the capabilities of our troops, our troops need today and tomorrow. This is what the taxpayers expect and what our warfighters deserve. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Mr. Trafkin. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Pull that mic up closer. Make sure it's on. I'll even turn it on. Okay. Uh, again, thank you, Madam Chairwoman, Ranking Member Bill Bray, and members of the subcommittee. Uh, since you've placed my statement in the record, I would like to address. Uh, three issues in the five minutes that you've allotted me uh, that I think merit your attention as they do mine every day. Uh, those three issues deal with our acquisition workforce, the tools available to that acquisition workforce, and then three separate policy considerations that ought to guide everything we do in federal acquisition. As far as GSA's acquisition workforce, I'm pleased to report to the committee that we are working on a succession plan that will help us address exactly how many people we need to do the work uh, that we're given each, e each year and to make sure that we recruit and retain those people through the life of a, a standard federal career. Currently, we suffer from uh, a deficit in uh, the competencies and skills and in certain year groups. Mm -hmm. This is a principal result of the fact that during the 1990s we chose not to hire people as part of our attempt to reduce the size of the government workforce. I'm not criticizing that decision, but the result of that decision is now, as we look for people between their 10th and 20th year of service, we don't have very many. And as we look at the folks in between their 20th and 30th year of service, uh, we're facing the possibility of almost 50 percent of our workforce retiring by the year 2012. The only thing that has kept our retirements down, I believe, is the current state of the economy. Our workforce is the key way we get jobs done. I mean, when you talk about oversight, when you talk about writing good contracts, when you talk about getting best value for the taxpayer, it's not done by a machine, it's not done by a policy, it's done by an individual who's trained and equipped to sit down at the table, not only negotiate a contract that represents the best value to the government, but then who has the time and ability to manage that contract to a successful conclusion. Today, most of our contracting officers are measured on how many contracts they award, and as soon as they award one, they have to move on to awarding the next and don't have the time they would like to devote to making sure that the effort they put into negotiating a good contract results in a good result to the taxpayer when the contract's concluded. We expect to complete our succession plan uh, sometime by the end of this fiscal year in accordance with the direction Congress has given all federal agencies to address succession planning. The second issue I think we need to talk about is tools. Uh, despite the fact that this is an IT-rich environment, despite the fact that we buy IT for everybody else, the acquisition community lacks the kind of IT tools it needs to leverage the existing workforce and to help them avoid making simple mistakes. In a hearing I testified in before the full committee not terribly long ago on EPLS, the question was, why did you award contracts to individuals who were on the EPLS about 30 times over five years? And the answer was, somebody made a mistake. 
but had they had the proper tool in place, the opportunity to make that mistake, to check automatically the EPLS would have been reduced. Not impossible that the mistake would have occurred, but it would have reduced it. And so we are looking in GSA at adopting and acquiring a tool which may be a single solution or a system of systems that will allow us to automate the entire process, thus leveraging the workforce we have and ensuring that mistakes that can be avoided by use of a transparent tool will be avoided. Finally, the issue of policy is important to look at. The President has done something, I think, quite unusual. Uh, in the last several months, uh, or the first several months of his presidency, he's talked about acquisition a number of times, including issuing on March 4th a, guide, a do guidance document to the federal government on acquisition. And in that document, he talked about two key principles, competition and transparency. These are not new principles. These are not principles that we weren't aware of and didn't work with before. But it's essential that we understand competition in today's changing environment and that we spend our efforts and time making competition a reality. And by the way, Madam Chairman, in your opening statement, you said that competition had been reduced. Actually, as a percentage of the whole, our statistics show that competition has not been reduced. It's about the same it was and has been over the last decade. But because of the size of the dollars we're spending, the, the, the gross number of dollars that have been awarded in a other than full and open competition have increased, but the percentage of dollars has re stayed relatively the same. Transparency is important. I would simply mention to the committee, even though my time is up, that the United States is the most transparent acquisition system in the world. I just recently concluded a meeting with my colleagues from Taiwan, Korea, Italy, Canada, and they're amazed at the amount of information we provide the taxpayers and the citizens on government procurement. You can literally find out every contract we award any time of the day or night. And finally, integrity, which goes to Mr. Bill Bray's comment about oversight. We would like to do more oversight, but unfortunately, as a result of a decision made many years ago, all of our internal auditors which public companies have under Sarbanes-Oxley have been taken away and made part of the IG's office. So as a manager, I have no internal audit function to assist me in providing oversight on a regular basis as any good manager would. I can certainly talk for much longer, but I appreciate the committee's indulgence in my exceeding my allotted time. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you to both of the witnesses. Uh, you've given us a lot of food for thought. And our members this morning will be raising the questions that will extend your time. Uh, we're very concerned about the oversight. And so what we are trying to do here is take a cursory look. And so I will raise some questions. I think both of you have probably answered them, but in a format so we can really hear uh, the changes and the recommendations that you make stated as a result of your statements, uh, I'm going to just go through them again. Because in response to President Obama's March 2009 memo on directives for agencies to report back on improving the FAR and its agency-specific supple uh, supplements, what types, and you have mentioned some, but let's get in the format, of recommendations or changes are your agencies making, and would you repeat, Mr. Saad, I did hear several. Yes, Madam Chair, uh, specifically, uh, some of the things that, that we're doing these days, uh, it was mentioned by one of the members that we're spending a tremendous amount of money on acquisition, on services. We now spend more money on services within the department than we do on major weapon systems. And uh, last year, it exceeded $200 billion. And, and what we are now doing is we have implemented a series of, of things called independent management reviews, where every procurement over a billion dollars is given significant oversight, not only prior to the award of the contract, but during the performance of that contract. contract uh, Congress mandated that we do that in, in the NDAA 08, 
and we've now got that in place. But we have expanded on uh, Congress's intent to not just be uh, services contracts over a billion dollars, but in fact every contract, irrespective of what it's for, goes through an independent management review. And so we look at it before we issue the RFP, while the evaluation is going on to ensure that in fact we're having a proper evaluation. And then lastly, once the contract decision or the decision for award is made, that in itself is examined. And then every year we review that contract to see if in fact the taxpayers are getting what they, have, what they paid for. Uh, that process was put into play about uh, seven months ago. We have reviewed over 40 uh, programs to date and are in process of reviewing them. This is an ongoing thing. It requires the participation of senior executive service and or general officers and flag officers to participate in these reviews whenever we can. It includes contracts managers, engineers, program managers, auditors, uh, as well as uh, the general counsel's office. And the whole idea here is to ensure that uh, we are in fact utilizing best practices across the department, and secondly, that we're adhering to the regulations as we proceed with these procurements so that we can ensure that the taxpayers, that they're getting a fair deal and the warfighters are getting what they need. Is this information going to be up online? Uh, the, we are working right now uh, with OMB uh, to discuss how we could in fact put parts of this information online. Many of these uh, procurements are uh, competitive and a source selection in nature. So there are certain aspects of it that we can't put online, but certainly the result and the general findings, uh, we're in process of doing that right now. I think we were at sleep at the switch in the last administration, and the oversight wasn't what it should have been. Uh, the public is very leery, and so they're talking about the debt we're in and the next generation to come and those yet unborn and so on. Uh, I think we have to, in some way, try to weed out that information that might be classified and really put the uh, information where people, the taxpayers, can see what we're doing. It takes money uh, in these conflicts and to protect our military and to win, it's costly. Yes, Everyone has to sacrifice, but we need to give them a reason for feeling they have to sacrifice. Yes, Mr. Driven. In GSA, we've instituted a uh, procurement management review process. Actually, we instituted that process over five years ago now. And in that process, we, uh, we visit all of our major contracting facilities once a year. We randomly select contracts, we review those contracts, and we provide feedback to our colleagues on the quality of the contract file, the contracting act, the acquisition plan, and their management of that contract. In addition, uh, just recently, beginning last September, we added the A123 reviews, which is uh, OMB circular, uh, which primarily used to focus just on the financial side, and now we have added an additional layer of review. We've added individuals to our team to do those kinds of reviews. In addition to the reviews themselves, we bring in colleagues from other offices so that they can bring their experience to the review process and share their experience with their colleagues and so that they can learn home to their own uh, offices, things that they learned that were be done, being done differently or uniquely somewhere else. The result of this process, well, we believe, will be validated quite shortly when the DODIG completes its review of GSA next year. We believe that... Speak uh, right into the mic. Uh, we, uh, we believe that that review... I think someone turned down the sound so it wouldn't get the feedback. We believe that review will uh, validate the fact that uh, not only have we been getting it right, but we continue to get it right every day. Uh, my time is up, but uh, I have one more question. I'll give myself an additional minute. And are any specific changes addressing the use of multi-award schedules 
going to be included in your submissions and both of you I'd like you to respond uh, madam chair we are we are moving forward to uh, reduce the number of multiple award contracts that we have uh, these can be uh, terrific tools for our people to use but one of the things that we want to make sure of is that they are in fact promoting competition and that they're not used as a mechanism to simply obligate funds and so we are looking very hard at the practices that we're using to ensure that we provide fair opportunity uh, we're specifically looking at uh, where we have small businesses who have who have been awarded multiple award contracts and who are capable of doing the work that that work is properly set aside for small businesses to compete on and so uh, what what you'll see is uh, a number of actions being taken by the department to improve our competitive posture uh, last year we uh, we've actually set a record within the department in terms of the most dollars and uh, the largest single percentage that we've ever competed having said that it's not anywhere near enough and we know that we need to improve and and one of the areas that we can in fact improve upon is in the is in award of delivery and task orders under multiple award contracts and you'll be seeing a number of policy statements come out as well as changes in our policy guidance and information of the DFARS with regard to improving competitive opportunities in multiple award contracts. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Madam Chairwoman, I first like to make a distinction between schedules, which is a program run by the administrator of GSA, and multiple award IDIQ contracts, which we all have authority to run. GSA schedules program has always required competition. Our customers compliance with that rule has on occasion been a little spotty. As you probably are aware, almost five years ago we developed a program called eBuy, an electronic method so that all members, all, all contractors holding a schedule can be selected. DOD, in fact, is required to use eBuy when they use our schedules program and the number of bids or RFQ or quotes that they've received has increased to an average of between three and six um, per, per competition. But, it, but they solicit from all schedule holders. On IDIQ contracts, there's always been a requirement for fair opportunity. It's a question of administration of that requirement that has been put in issue. But I think the real issue is what Shea touched on, Madam Chairman, and that is also what we addressed. I served as a member of the Sour Panel, and later you'll hear from our chairperson, Marsha Mad Madsen, is that we probably have way too many IDIQ contracts in the government. It costs us money to award those contracts and administer them. It costs industry money to compete for them. And I'm not sure it contributes to competition or better pricing overall. In the last Congress, there was direction to OMB to begin a process to manage the number of IDIQ contracts government-wide. And I believe once a new administrator is appointed in OMB and OFPP, uh, that that process will begin and we will see some success in reducing the overall number of IDIQ contracts. Thank you. For our ranking member, I'll give you an extra minute, <laughs> Mr. Bilbray. No problem, Madam Chair. I think your question was quite appropriate and served the entire process and, the, and this committee. Um, uh, Mr. Durbin, I appreciate you pointing out, I think when we get into this, we got to look at our successes and we are the most transparent system in the world. Um, we just forget that um, outside of Mexico, we're the only place where we don't follow the British godforsaken parliamentary system to where winner takes all and that the administration is nothing but an arm of the lower house. Um, so I think um, as Americans, we always talk about other countries and think they're in our system. We have a very unique system and it works. And that's why this relationship between the executive branch and the, the legislative branch in the process of oversight is so important and needs to be not just um, cooperated with but embraced. Um, uh, I guess, gentlemen, what I first want to uh, uh, talk about is we really are in crisis on this issue. Uh, and what I worry about in crisis, when you look at how much of the budget cannot be 
accounted for in so many ways at a time that we now are looking at almost another trillion dollars that we don't know how we're going to account for. There is this crisis, and the problem is with crisis is that we always look, talk about tactical issues during crisis, and we ignore the opportunity to really now kind of learn from our mistakes and our challenges and look at the strategic. And I'd like to sort of back off a second and take a look at the strategic. Uh, the question over at, at DOD, we have interns that come in and participate in a training program, basically, don't we? What percentage of those interns uh, do we actually end up hiring uh, after they've gone through the, the intern system? We, we actually do very well in terms of hiring the interns. The, the real question is, can we retain them? And, and I would say that it's not unusual in, in our intern programs to see turnover of 30 to 40%. Now, the question is, well, where are they going? Well, to some degree, they go to my brothers and sisters and the rest of the federal government. And while we hate to lose them out of the Department of Defense, that in and of itself is not a bad thing. But in fact, we do lose uh, a, a number of them to industry because we happen to have the finest training system in the world in, in terms of training people in acquisition and, and in procurement at the Defense Acquisition University. It's, it's without peer. And so uh, folks know that when they get somebody, especially an intern, through our training program, that they have been well trained. And so what we're doing is, is that we are taking a number of steps. And in, to a certain degree, Mr. Congressman, this is all about leadership. It's, it's we're, we're getting our leaders actively engaged in ensuring that they communicate with the workforce on an ongoing basis in terms of their value. And, and I think the Secretary and Deputy Secretary have stood, has stood tall and basically said, we're going to make a significant change in the size and capacity of our workforce. And that has gone a tremendous way in terms of uh, almost overnight uh, in significantly improving the morale of the workforce because now, they see help on the way. So base, we basically absorb all our interns, and then it's this revolving door. They yes, come sir. in, they get a job, and then they end up getting a better offer either in another department or outside the? Yeah, I'd say about 30, 35 percent of them do that. Yes, sir. But 30, we retain 35 percent about, we, come we in. We retain about two-thirds of them. What percentage never get a job, do you think? A very small number. You know, we do, there are some folks who just either they decide that this isn't for me, or we decide they're just never going to hack it. But that's a very small percentage of it. Yeah, I'll say this, and I know that the gentleman from Fairfax County may get concerned about this, but it's too bad we don't have the type of contractual arrangement with our um, civilian employees that we have with our military, basically saying, if we're going to spend this much time training you as a naval aviator, we expect you to sign on for this long. And, um, you know, the, the, that kind of arrangement somewhere down the line may be a radical concept now, but I think as we get in these challenges, we, we should be looking a lot. I guess the issue comes down to retention, though, too. It's a lot of the, the, um, um, the institutional mindset. I think this administration ran a campaign that really should be setting an example of maybe how this administration should be looking at um, the modification of the federal uh, uh, bureaucracy, and that is this administration captured young people and captured the, the potential for not only the young people, but the technology that they are so comfortable with. And I guess the issue there of retaining more of these, these young, bright stars is how we can change our internal operation, the, you know, section by section to not only um, allow these young stars to use their new tools that they have, but to embrace it and be brave enough. I know all of us here, um, you know, that, that are on the front row here, may be less than comfortable with the technology and the approaches that, that the people will find behind you or behind us, you know, not only um, uh, are comfortable with, but embrace and integrate it into their day-to-day -day life. And I, my question to you is, how can we modify the system to be more open to the junior members who are coming up with their mindset and their new, their new savvy and uh, direct them to be the next generation of, of oversight? 
Congressman, we're, we're making a, a number of changes in that regard. And frankly, it's not just the, the, uh, the younger uh, or those less experienced or those more, uh, more comfortable in, in the information and technology age. The, the fact of the matter is we need to do a much better job within the department and across federal government in sharing information and knowledge about the business deals that we have. How do we do business with different contractors? Uh, it is not unusual to have uh, certain products being bought from organizations within the Army, Navy, and Air Force and having never had them talk to one another about doing business with the very same company that sells to all three. So what we're doing is, is we're about to make a, a remarkable change in, in how we collect and disseminate especially business information. DCMA is going to become the cost analysis center for us and so that our, our young employees will be able to log on, uh, immediately go on a, in a web-based tool into that DCMA database, get the information they need quickly, and then be able to process that so that they can understand what are the terms of the business deal that they're getting. The fact of the matter is, is that w we are, uh, we are not as, as capable as, as a number of, of organizations in terms of being able to share that information, but we are getting there. And I think you'll see a significant change over the next couple of years, especially in the way we share business deal information. Well, Mr. Durbin, I, my, my biggest concern is that there are those of us that are in the position to make decisions and almost as if, you know, I grew up along the border, and the one thing I've learned very quickly is no matter how much you learn a language, it's not the same as growing up with it. Um, you think certain ways. And I think um, our generation, if I may expand our, the relationship, will always have a blind spot that we need to do translation to understand what these kids are up to and with their technology and their approach. Um, only because they grew up with it. This is their primary way of thinking. Uh, how do we figure out how to tap into that? It's almost like man's first experiment with fire or with nuclear power. We may, um, you know, first of all, it intimidates us to some degree, and we may not understand it, but boy, the potential is huge. How do uh, us old guys able to develop a system and actually embrace these kids and their technology while still directing it, even though we may not speak the language or, or, um, as our primary source? Actually, I'm, I'm very lucky to be at GSA because at GSA we have a culture that has adopted and continues to adopt the changes in the, in the IT world and in the way we approach our business. Um, we are able to attract folks right out of college. We, un we use collaborative tools. We're into cloud computing. We are, we're on the edge. We have, our people have the most current and up-to-date electronic devices and access to them. We have a process. Because of the problem of the, of the hiring in the 90s, we're, we're advancing people now that would never be being advanced at this stage in their career. We, we don't have a choice. We've got to have people to do the work, and so somebody who has uh, between five and ten years experience is now getting a chance to do things that they never would have gotten a chance to do if we had had a complete cadre of people with uh, uh, that kind of experience. It kind of reminds me of what the Army was like when I came in in 1978 at the end of the Vietnam War. As a young captain who never tried a case in my life, I showed up and was made the Chief of Military Justice. I mean, those kinds of opportunities exist today and we're able to take advantage of those and leverage those in GSA. We're a much smaller agency than DOD, but I think you'll find if you talk to any of your, our young people who come in in the intern program that we have, that th they will tell you that GSA is taking advantage and knows how to talk to them. We, uh, they're using the social websites and the social and, and all these other tools, not only to attract people to come and work with us, but to keep them interested while they are working with us. Mr. I would like to point uh, out just Mr. One Bill point. Bradley, you yelled. Yes. Uh, you said in your opening statement that one of the problems you suffered from was the lack of being able to hire uh, well-trained, well-skilled, well-educated people. Uh, do we see 
within your budget the opportunity uh, to bring on the people with the skill sets that are needed. And uh, I'm listening very carefully because I know there has been much debate in our house about our budget deficit and uh, endangering the future lives and so on. Uh, Mr. Bilbray brings a very uh, thoughtful point, and that is we're in a culture of technology. And use the example of President Barack Obama. He used technology to its highest level, and that's how he surprised a nation and won. Uh, there's a lot of talent up there, out there. Are we going to be able to capture that? Will you have the budget? Will you be able to bring on uh, the kinds of people that you know can advance the agency? Well, well first of all, in in our career field, in the acquisition career field, right. there are very few people in the private sector who we can hire and put to work immediately. Because of the very nature of government procurement, all of our rules, all of our processes, which are unique, you don't find them in the private sector. Even the county of Fairfax sir, doesn't have the same level of, of uh, I used to be a resident of the county, doesn't have the same level of regulation and process that we provide in the federal government. So when we hire somebody, typically we have got to train them. Yeah. And that training process takes uh, somewhere between one and a half to two years before we can even put them out on their own to begin doing the kind of work that are we Are we in that do. process? We are in the processes of hiring them. In GSA, which, and we're different from other agencies because as you know, uh, Congress appropriates very little, no money for the operation of our Federal Acquisition Service and very little money for the operation of our Public Building Service. We earn uh, through revenue, through sales to other agencies, the money we then use to reinvest in our workforce and our tools. Uh, we and GSA have the flexibility to acquire more people. If you talk to my colleagues in the other civilian agencies, I think you would hear a different story. They require an appropriated budget in order to increase, increase the number of FTE, full-time equivalents, they need in the acquisition workforce. But I'm not sure that the question is really increase the acquisition workforce so much, well, I'm sure you have to increase the acquisition workforce. I don't know that the answer is that we have to increase the workforce as a whole, and I can't speak for other people, but I certainly think we ought to have a business process that looks at where are the competencies and skills that we need to have in-house to do our work, and those people we should hire. And where are the competencies and skills that we can buy from the private sector to get our work done and are not essential? to the government's performance of its mission, and those we can buy. And those are the kinds of decisions that I know are difficult. I know that this committee and others will be discussing. I realize they also have issues relevant to political party platforms. Uh, I'm a career civil servant. I don't get in those discussions. What I'm concerned about is making sure that we have enough people to manage the $556 billion worth of contracts we awarded last year. By the way, in 1991, we had 33,700 1102s in the whole federal government. An 1102 is a contract specialist. It's a person we hire and train to award contracts. Last year, we had 28,700 1102s. In 1990, we awarded $150 billion worth of contracts. Last year, we awarded $556 billion worth of contracts. Do the math. Mr. Durping, in other words, what happened was we did, and all of us were participating except for the gentleman from Fairfax, um, that reduction during the 90s. And then we hit the crisis of 9-11, and all at once we saw a huge ratcheting up of contracting. They, um, the, the question I really get to is that we're approaching, a, you know, we're in a crisis mode now, and there's opportunity, obviously, in the crisis. Just as the military during tough times traditionally has always had um, the ability to cherry pick um, for that level of, of 
of uh, employee and the training and the different entry level. We actually have a unique situation right now, at least indications from coming out of the universities, is that you now have people that, especially in IT, that normally would not be available for government service, now are looking to government service for that stability um, that never was considered for a long time, so, you know, going back to, I guess, the 79, I guess is the closest time we've seen, even then it may not be. So right now, the word is that as these kids are coming out in June, they're looking to come to Washington. They're looking to work for government now. And now is the opportunity for us to go do the cherry picking and be very aggressive at grabbing these kids while we can and get them into the system and hopefully we'll be able to lock them into a career before they start, you know, the economy starts recovering and they start seeing opportunities other places. Yes, Mr. Uh, I'm going to go to our next member, Mr. Connolly, and then if you want to respond uh, to Mr. Bilbray's uh, comment, you can do it uh, along with answering his questions. I thank the chair lady. Um, and I, I want to invite my colleague, my friend from uh, California. Um, I'm so glad he began by asking about the internship program because I, I, it's a concern I've got based on testimony we've heard in previous hearings uh, before the subcommittee and the full committee. And I'm going to be introducing some legislation and I'd welcome sharing that in draft form with my colleagues uh, to see if it's of interest to them that would try to systematize um, uh, a, a, a internship program and, and look at at reporting in terms of outcomes so we have a better handle on that and certain elements, mentoring, rotation, evaluation, streamlining so it may make it easier if you are an intern, it's easier to get into the federal service uh, as we move out to the future. So I, I would welcome uh, sharing that uh, draft legislation with my colleagues to, to get their reaction but I do think we have to do something to encourage model programs of internship because we've heard both the good and the bad. Uh, about internship programs. And it seems to me that if somebody is, wants to be an intern with the federal government, they ought to leave highly motivated to want to continue to serve in the federal service. Uh, there may be lots of reasons why one elects not to, but I would hope it, one of those reasons is never because it was a negative experience. Uh, and we, we've heard stories where in some agencies that is unfortunately the case. Um, l let me go back to acquisition because I, I think, Mr. Drabkin, you you were giving some great numbers there and I think clearly what you showed was while the value of large acquisition contracts were going up, the number of qualified contract officers in the federal government were going down. Um, and so when you, as you said, do the math, uh, you know, we actually saw a significant uh, loss of skill sets in the federal government uh, in just sheer numbers. But even if you go behind those numbers, what I'm concerned about, having watched it from the other side, is that it's not just the actual number, it's also the skill set. We increasingly face a challenge in the federal government of do we have the requisite skill set to manage very large, complex technological contracts that are multi-year? Uh, that's number one, and I'd like both of you to address that. Secondly, what about our own internal uh, processes? I mean, we talk about cost overruns, but frankly, sometimes we, the federal government, we're responsible for those cost overruns because we change, in effect, the scope of the original work. I can think of one contract I'm familiar with where over uh, the life of a two or three year contract, we had, uh, this particular contractor had 14 federal co project managers, contract managers, each of whom, formally or informally, had his or her own view of the scope or what could or should be added. And by the end of the contract, it looked a lot different, unfortunately, than what originally was agreed to, and the contractor was in a tough spot. Uh, and trying to deal with the uh, the client. And so is the rotational system we've got within the federal government part of the problem? Can it, should it be changed? Let me uh, first talk to uh, the workforce itself, uh, Mr. Congressman. Uh, we went through, and, and I know some of the other federal agencies have done some competency modeling, but w we've gone through what we consider to be the most comprehensive competency modeling of the contracting workforce, uh, frankly, not only within the federal government, but probably uh, across industry. We had uh, approximately 18,000 uh, employees participate voluntarily in a competency modeling that examined their competencies in a very detailed and specific way. So we understand not only by uh, every particular organization, 
but across each department, Army, Navy, Air Force, as well as the other defense agencies, what our capability gaps are, and we understand what it is we have to do about it. Uh, in, in terms of uh, our growth and our workforce, uh, we're specifically going to hire about 5,300 contracting officers, about 2,500 defense contract management agency personnel, uh, 700 auditors, 800 pricing people, 300 uh, procurement and acquisition lawyers. So we, we understand very well what our capability gaps are, and we're very focused on, on improving those. Um, with regard to uh, the competency modeling itself, I, I think that that's a tool that everybody needs to use. I know GSA has a, a Dave and, and his team have a very uh, good system that they use over at GSA. And, uh, but we really do need to institute that across the department in a, in a very significant way so we can understand our capabilities across the workforce. Uh, in terms of rotations, uh, rotations can be a positive thing because you get uh, a specific uh, degree of experience across a wide variety of resources. But having said that, one of the things that we're doing now is, is we're requiring our program managers to sign term agreements to say that they're going to stay on for a specific period of time because, um, as, as, you, as you know, given your past experience, uh, when you have major weapon systems, it's not unusual for that to take seven, eight, nine years from uh, initiation to absolute fielding. And you might have two or three major program managers participating in a program along the way, and, and sometimes a program manager inherits decisions that weren't his to make. And so uh, we're, we're looking very seriously, seriously about that, about extending the terms of program managers, especially in our major programs. And uh, I think that with our term agreements, uh, with our program managers, it's going to go a long way to do that. Let me begin with, I think, the last things you talked about, but which is the most important thing for any acquisition, and that is the requirement. Um, and uh, I believe you're absolutely correct that in many cases when you look at why a contract changed over time or why a program changed, changed over time, you will find that at least in part it was attributable to requirements creep, we call it. Uh, the requirement started out as being an automobile and before you finished it's a jet aircraft. And by the way, if you start out to buy an automobile, you're going to get a lousy jet aircraft when you're done. Um, but our community, the, the acquisition community, does not re control the requirements side of the house. We respond to it. And the second most important thing is what we do once we get that requirement, and that is the acquisition planning process, which has been codified and institutionalized for many, many years, but which still today, because of a lack of time, because of a lack of people, uh, and, and because of a lack of management direction or, over, or, or uh, interest, uh, the acquisition planning process in many cases across the government uh, gets left out. But it's that during that process where you look at the requirements again, you make sure you redefine the requirements, you do your best to make sure it's nailed down and all the changes you can anticipate are taken care of, and then how you decide to satisfy those requirements through the acquisition process, including justifying what kind of contract you're going to write based upon the nature of those requirements or how you're going to define the competition because all requirements don't compete equally in the marketplace. When you get to rotational assignments, I do agree that there is a problem with the fact that we have both contracting officers and project managers who, during the course of their career, change jobs. And GSA, we don't have the ability to direct someone not to go somewhere else. We can avoid internal management reassignments, but if they get an opportunity to work for another department, if they decided they've had enough and don't want to work for the federal government anymore, now we have no ability to keep them in one place, although we are looking at ways to 
uh, retain them, things that we can do to incentivize them to stay in one place and complete a project till its very end. Although some of our projects are quite long, not as long as those my colleague has in the Department of Defense, but when you're building a major courthouse, you don't do it in 12 months and making sure you hold the team together to get that courthouse done and GSA builds a lot of courthouses is something we're looking at. Finally, the level of competency and difficulty has changed in what we buy. And it's different than what most state and local governments uh, do in terms of buying. In the federal government, we decided back in the 1990s we would buy best value. We would stop buying low price. It was Secretary Perry, who was then the Secretary of Defense, who came to this body and said and reported to this body that it was costing the Department of Defense a fortune to buy low price because you'd buy something that was the lowest price and it would wear out sooner than something else and you'd have to go out and rebuy it and there were costs associated with all of it. In addition, we were buying from companies that weren't performing well and so we went to best value and best value requires a level of competency and skill which is different than picking the low price. And judgment. That's part of the competency and skill and the ability not only to figure out what best value is, but then because of our system and because of our requirements of transparency, to be able to describe what that best value is so that my grandmother in northwest Alabama will understand what best value means. And believe me, that's hard to do. And that, that requirement has changed and it's made it more difficult for our workforce. And if you don't mind, I'd like to address just a couple other things that Mr. Bilbray said. First of all, we don't need people to come to Washington. They can work from other places. And one of the great things about GSA is we can hire people all over the country and they can work for us from wherever they are. And we are looking at those kinds of opportunities because, by the way, once this economic yeah. this situation Mr. resolves Draken, itself, I, coming I, to Washington I will be I have to terrible. reclaim my time, Madam Chairman, because I have to be on the floor shortly. So if I may, forgive me, Mr. Drabkin, but yes, I, uh, Mr. Bill Bray, I know we'll have another opportunity. Uh, uh, I take your points about rotation. Certainly there is a positive aspect to that and keeping somebody fresh, wanting new challenges. Uh, you don't want people to get stale and you certainly want once in a while a fresh look at a contract. Uh, no question about that. But on the other hand, if you have say a, not a, an eight or 10 or 20 year project, but you've got a two or three year project uh, that, that has a clear beginning and a clear end with, I hope, a clear mission, clear objectives. Uh, there is something not only satisfying but desirable, it seems to me, for someone to take that on as his or her project, I'm going to see it through to the end. And it's incumbent, it seems to me, on, on federal managers to create an environment and a system of incentives that allows for that. I think both of you would agree that if you're looking at, a, say, a three- or four-year contract with 14 project managers, that's a recipe for discontinuity and, frankly, dysfunctionality in outcomes. I agree with you, Mr. Congressman, and, and that is a function of, of, in most cases, capacity and people. And, and that's why we're increasing, of that 20,000 folks, uh, approximately 10,000 of them uh, will be program managers, systems engineers, logistics managers, uh, because we realize that, that not only do we have to increase the uh, capability of that particular side of the workforce, but there's got to be a steadying capacity to deal with our programs. Uh, with this, I want to conclude uh, the testimony for this panel, and I thank you very, very much. Uh, we will be back with you. I think that uh, your statements have given us, as I said, a lot of food for thought. So uh, you may, and I do have follow-up questions, but we'll probably get them to you in writing. And um, so with that, you may be excused, and thank you so much for your testimony. Mm -hmm. Madam Chairman, uh, we're just sad that Mr. Drabkin apparently is no longer with Fairfax County. <laughs> yes, I'm now Ms. Uh, Norton's constituent. <laughs> I now like to invite our second panel of witnesses to come forward, please. He figured he wasn't paying enough taxes. <laughs> <laughs> the, the commuter tax intimidated me.
Now, as all of you understand, this is the policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. And we swear in all witnesses before they testify. And I'd like all of you to, and you're on your foot, feet, so that's great. Raise your right hand. Okay. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right. Uh, let the record show that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. I'll now take a moment to introduce our distinguished panelists. Uh, first, we have uh, Mr. William Gormley who serves as the chairman of the Coalition for Government Procurement and as president and chief uh, executive officer of the Washington Man Management Group. Prior to his current post, he served as the assistant commissioner for the Office of Acquisition, Federal Supply Service at the General Services Administration. Next, we have Mr. Philip Bond, the president of Tech America. Mr. Bond is also president of the World Information Technology and Services Alliance, a network of industry associates and associations representing seven high-tech trade groups around the world. And previously, Mr. Bond served as the undersecretary of the U.S. Department of Commerce for Technology. And from 2002 to 2003, he served concurrently as Chief of Staff to Commerce Secretary Dono Evans. Uh, Mr. John McNerney serves as the General Counsel for the Mechanical Contractors Association of America. There, uh, he works on numerous labor management relations issues along with issues associated with the legislative advocacy, public procurement, and a variety of other private and public contracting policy issues. Uh, Ms. Karen L. Manos is the chair-elect of the Procurement Planning Committee of the National Defense Industrial Association and is a partner with the law firm of Gibson and Crutcher, LLP, where she is uh, co-chair of the firm's government and commercial contracts practice group. Next, Ms. Kara M. Shaloto. Uh, Say it again. Sakalato. Uh, is a partner with the law firm Wiley Rain, LLP. And there she focuses on litigation matters relating to government contracts and has represented government contracts clients in both protests, claims, litigation, prime contractor disputes, and trade secret misappropriation litigation. Then Ms. Marcia Madsen is a partner with the law firm Meyer Brown LLP. There she focuses on multiple issues associated with government contracts and litigation. She also served as the chair of the acquisition advisory panel authorized under the service Acquisition Reform Act of uh, 2003, which provided 89 specific reforms to federal procurement laws and regulation. And finally, uh, Mr. Scott Amy is the general counsel for the Project on Government Oversight. There he directs POGO's uh, contract oversight investigations, including reviews of federal spending on goods and services, the responsibility of top federal contractors, and conflicts of interest and ethics concerns that have led to questionable contract awards. And uh, I will ask that uh, each one of the uh, witnesses just give a very, very brief uh, introduction of yourself and what you do. And uh, we're going to cut the time. I'm hoping that other members will come but we want to finish by 11 o'clock, so we're going to go very quickly. 
I'd like uh, Mr. Garmley to please proceed. Uh, um, would you be sure that your mic I think we have on? it on now. Thank you. Okay, there you are. Thank you, Madam Chair, Ranking Member, and, and members of the committee. I think in listening to the uh, dialogue that you had with Mr. Drapkin and, Sh and Shea Assad, I think I'm one of those rare birds. I actually uh, spent 30 years in government acquisitions, so maybe uh, we, we could talk about what, what it takes to stay in during the course or as we have more time today. But I hope my, my experience will be of value to the committee. Uh, the Coalition for Government Procurement, some members represent the, uh, I think we would view it as the commercial sector of uh, services and supplies, and they interact with the federal government. I had a paired five-minute uh, remarks. I will honor the request to shorten that and come back to it as we have time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bell. That's a tough act to follow, uh, Madam Chair. That was very brief. Uh, and Ranking Member Bilbray, uh, pleasure to be here. And congratulations on launching what I think is a vitally important series of hearings. On behalf of the technology industry, I'll try to summarize uh, quickly and give you our view. I think one is uh, that uh, we, we understand and appreciate the fact that this Congress and this administration get technology. All you have to do is look at the stimulus bill to see that. We are concerned that we don't, in the name of reform, uh, have some unintended consequences that would end up chasing away small, medium, or even large companies from the government marketplace and thereby undermine competition, innovation, and small business contracts. Unfortunately, there are some, uh, some proposals that may have that impact. Uh, the stimulus dollars do come with strings, uh, reporting requirements. They apply um, the rules even to commercial off-the-shelf contract items, which we think is perhaps counterproductive. Uh, contractors will be required to report on subcontracts, which may chase away some subcontractors. They require public disclosure of information that goes beyond Freedom of Information Act or other requirements. And they grant GAO the authority to interview individual employees without, as far as we can see, any uh, rules around uh, the rights of those individual employees. <coughs> so all this makes companies um, stop, pause, and rethink whether they even want to be in this marketplace. And obviously, we embrace competition. I represent uh, 1,500 companies, hundreds of which sell to the government, and so we, we certainly embrace competition. The President's memorandum on contracting also has some uh, rhetoric that sometimes uh, raises eyebrows in our community. However, it targets and, and identifies very laudable things, uh, including eliminating wasteful and efficient um, contracts on uh, well, it shows a clear preference for fixed price contracts, which I'll talk about in a minute. They also talk about uh, the appropriate times for government to outsource services. And the industry embraces that. We would benefit from a clear definition of when to outsource and, and some clarity around uh, the, the fixed price contracts versus others. However, we do believe that sometimes national security or the ability for a base in some critical area may uh, call for some flexibility in contracting and not always, always fixed price. Um, we do believe the administration knows right to look at these and we just ask that they do so with an eye toward flexibility again in the name of national security and <laughs> industrial base issues. And we hope that Congress will let the administration move along this path a little bit before changing the rules. I want to rattle off a few others very quickly, Madam Chair. Uh, on the insourcing issue, fundamentally we believe in a blended workforce that is going to take advantage of the uh, skill sets in government, the best of the public sector with the best of the private sector. The workforce that Mr. Connolly and Mr. Bill Bray raised, there are too few professionals with too little experience writing contracts that are very big and complex. Uh, and with billions coming in recovery funds, that problem potentially is going to get a whole lot worse. Uh, transparency has been referenced, especially the great uh, examples that were shown by the Obama campaign for president. We, um, we certainly embrace that, and we think that, for instance, OPM has to write some rules that, that uh, will, will tell employees what they can and cannot use in terms of some of the new social networking capabilities. And um, uh, we want to make sure that as we pursue transparency, we don't require companies to file information that would unfairly give advantage to their competitors overseas or would go beyond the Freedom of Information Act. In conclusion, uh, the committee has launched an important series of hearings. The goals the administration has laid out for participatory democracy, greater access, openness, transparency, all of those will demand 
modernization, and we hope that the committee will consider ways to reform the policies, remove barriers, and encourage more innovation. And we remain confident that together, the best of the public sector, the best of the private sector, that we can meet the mission for both the government and the taxpayers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McNerney. You can proceed. Good morning. Is that mic on? There, there it is. Madam Chairwoman, I'm representing here today five construction trade associations, the Mechanical Contractors Association, the Sheet Metal and Air Conditioning uh, Contractors National Association, the Association of Union Constructors, the International Council of Employers of Bricklayers and Allied Craft Workers, and the Finishing Contractors Association. Madam Chairwoman, we have, our committees have come up with 10 uh, construction procurement recommendations that respond in one way or another to the various aspects of the discussion today. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to rattle them off by name. Uh, our number one priority is we think the committee, even though this is a fiscal committee matter, that this committee we would respectfully submit should take cognizance of this new 3% withholding tax, which is going to affect public contracts in 2012. But the agencies are going to have to start spending their procurement resources to gear up for this uh, probably next fiscal year. DOD has estimated it will cost their procurement budget $17 billion over five years to change their payment programming systems, personnel, and to add the financing cost in their contracts for that measure. So we would ask respectfully, uh, Madam Chairwoman, that the committee take cognizance of that and see what impact it might have on the procurement agencies, excuse me, overall. Um, if tax delinquency is a problem for public contractors, then we think the rapid deployment of the contractor legal compliance database is a better way to keep tax delinquents out of the procurement programs. Uh, we would also submit that because this raises payment issues and if the tax goes into effect, extending the federal prompt payment law to federally assisted contracts would become all the more important. If there's going to be added withholding, then we certainly want to ensure that the payment of the amounts that the invoices do is, is given more rapidly. We also would submit that the regulators are going to have to be very, very careful that that 3 percent withholding tax doesn't go down the contracting chain to subcontractors. IRS agrees with that, but we think the regs will have to be very careful. Uh, some of our other procurement reforms, we think you should look at bid listing on low bid uh, uh, direct federal uh, construction contracts. We've heard a lot of talk here today about negotiated selection and other aspects of the contractor selection procedure. We think a close look at the trends in procurement uh, methods probably warrants now reconsideration of the idea that prime contractors ought to, ought to list their major <coughs> subcontractors on low bid awards. We think you'd uh, improve the quality of com the, both the level and quality of comp competition in the federal market if you did that. Uh, we're supporters of the Obama administration's initiative on allowing consideration by agencies, both direct federal and federally assisted, of the use of project labor agreements on major construction projects. There's a lot of flexibility in that order. Even now, OMB and DOL are considering ways to, to shape that, and we would urge this committee to take some cognizance of that and see if you can help the agency find the ways to use the benefits. We represent union signatory specialty contractors. We have an interest in project labor agreements, and we also know that they work very well, and the taxpayers would, are well served by them when they are used. And finally, uh, back to the low bid, we th would like this committee to consider enacting again, proposing again to outlaw reverse auction, internet reverse auction for construction procurement. Well, that's a bad idea when it was proposed. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers roundly condemned it, and we would hope Congress would uh, enact the Corps' recommendation and, and legislate against it in federal procurement. Some agencies still do it. And finally, we, we would like you to consider and protect, especially uh, construction industry, the federal government in, over the next 20 years is going to make all its facilities and building stock net zero energy carbon neutral 
over 20 years. That's going to require a tremendous amount of building operations, maintenance, commissioning, energy service contracting, uh, energy auditing. And we think we would like to suggest that we protect that and continue to outsource that and not bring that work that is not inherently governmental back in-house in an insourcing review. So thank you, Madam Chairwoman. That concludes my thank remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Menos <laughs> may proceed. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Madam Chairwoman, members of the committee, thank you very much for the opportunity to appear before you, and I applaud your efforts in launching. Is that on? Is that on? In launching this important series of hearings, I'm, I'm here both in my personal capacity and as representing the National Defense Industrial Association. I've been practicing in this area for 28 years since I graduated from the Air Force Academy, and I hope I offer a balanced perspective. I spent 14 years on active duty in the Air Force as a contract negotiator and then a judge advocate, and for the last 14 years have represented mostly major defense contractors. My entire professional life has been spent in the area of government contracting, and I have a deep and abiding personal and professional interest in it. I think if we step back, though, and look at, at what we've done since beginning with the Reagan administration and then taking up greater steam during the Clinton administration, which is the, there was this bipartisan effort to, to kind of unwind federal procurement and get rid of a lot of the, what had grown up over the years that was like barnacles, and it just made it very anything. Unfortunately, as a part of the quid pro quo for doing that, we also cut the acquisition workforce dramatically. I think in hindsight that was the mistake, but I'm concerned that Congress, by reacting to things, may layer on additional layers of statutes and regulations that just add to the burdens that we had in the past. And if you think back to President Clinton's signing statement when he signed the Federal Acquisition Streamlining Act, and he mentioned the fact that during Desert Storm we couldn't buy the Motorola two-way radios that we needed for our troops, and we had to turn to the Japanese to buy them for us and to give them to us. We wrap ourselves up into knots, and there's a cost in doing that. And I'm concerned that if you, if you don't have that perspective and we react to the crisis of the day or the, the scandal of the day and we just add these layers, that it's really misguided oversight. And what I've highlighted in my written testimony are three areas where I think that there are sort of intractable problems from my perspective. The first is the Defense Contract Audit Agency, which I think has, has completely lost its path. It's lost its understanding of what Congress directed it to do, the statutes that it's directed to do, and it's focusing on areas that really just bollocks up the procurement system with no good end. It's adding costs, but it's not really bringing any value to the taxpayer. The second is the acquisition workforce, which is a huge problem. The acquisition, you need to have trained, motivated contracting officers in order to make the acquisition process work. Unfortunately, we've lost that balance. We've lost the training. They're not motivated. They're certainly not appreciated. And now with the Defense Contract Audit Agency, we have them intimidating them. And then the final area is the contract disputes process, which is, was intended by Congress with the enactment of the Contract Disputes Act to be an in a, a quick, effective way of, of resolving disputes. And it's turned out not to be that at all. It's a very laborious, time-consuming process that's not good for the government, it's not good for contractors. And those are three areas where I think that Congress really could do some good to, to weigh in and to try to resolve things. Thank you for the opportunity to appear. Thank you. You may proceed. Is it on? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. I'll turn it around towards you, if you can. Thank you very much for this opportunity to present my testimony here today. Uh, as you mentioned, Chairwoman Watson, I am an attorney in private practice, but I'm also an adjunct professor of government contracts law at George Mason University School of Law. Um, my written testimony details my views, and, and in the interests of, of keeping it short, I, I will try to do so. This morning, we heard about um, the uh, from Mr. Drabkin and from Ranking Member Bill Bray that uh, our procurement system is already a model for many other countries. It's an open procurement system. There are certainly regulatory controls uh, in place today that are effective tools for regulating our procurement community. So as this subcommittee continues on with its efforts to investigate ways of strengthening our procurement system, uh, one option is to consider whether instead of additional regulation, what we need is a renewed focus on execution of existing regulations and oversight mechanisms that are in place. And 
uh, whether our existing regulatory system can respond to the policy challenges that are being identified today. Uh, one, uh, two that come to mind are cost reimbursement contracting and sole source contracting that were mentioned in President Obama's memorandum on government contracting. Today we have an existing regulatory scheme in place that counsels when to use cost reimbursement contracts and fixed price contracts. There is a place for both in our procurement system and one size does not fit all. Likewise, there are also tools in our existing federal regulation system for promoting full and open competition and requiring uh, justification when full and open competition is not used and also addressing uh, those exigent circumstances that the President identified in his memorandum when uh, full and open competition might not be uh, what, what serves the interests of the government best. So I would, uh, one recommendation is to focus our attention on executing, better execution of our existing regulations, which uh, is entirely consistent with the testimony we heard today about increasing our acquisition workforce so that we can better apply our regulations, better define requirements, and therefore uh, exercise oversight in that matter manner. My second recommendation is simply as if additional regulation is recommended, that we do so in a coordinated fashion so that we maintain to the extent possible and practical uniformity in our regulatory system um, and not proceed down various different paths or continually uh, by death of a thousand cuts add to the regulatory system. Uh, coordinated regulation, uniformity are hallmarks uh, that scholars recognize of a strong procurement system. Lastly, my final point is, is somewhat related to my first in that um, as this committee goes through and, and tries to gather information about what is, an, is effective for strengthening our procurement system, uh, one of the data points that, that will be very valuable is experience under the recently enacted regulatory and legislative reform initiatives. Many of those initiatives have just been passed into law. Some of them have only recently been put into regulation. Some have not even been put into regulation yet. None of them really has the kind of track record that we can see whether or not they have been effective and, and the costs and benefits have, have worked out positively. So uh, as, as Congress can, and this subcommittee thinks about ways to improve our system, it should wait and let the efforts that it has already initiated uh, see if they bear fruit before uh, determining that additional regulation is required. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Madsen. Madam Chairwoman, uh, Congressman Bilbray, um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today to uh, update you on the progress in implementing the uh, recommendations of the Acquisition Advisory Panel. It's terrific to be on this side of this effort, I might add. Um, the panel's objective, as it was described in, in our report, was to provide meaningful improvements to the acquisition system that would allow agencies to obtain the benefit of commercial practices to better achieve their mission, and with recognition that a balance is necessary to achieve transparency and accountability necessary for the expenditure of public funds. The panel's report was focused on giving the government and its acquisition workforce improved capability to make wise decisions about expenditure of the taxpayers' money. Many of the panel's recommendations have now been adopted in legislation and regulations, um, about 37, I think, depending on how you count the, the bits and pieces. Um, and I should note that the panel attempted to provide uh, recommendations that could principally be implemented through regulation, although Congress has picked up a number of those and, and put them in legislation <coughs> as well. I just want to talk about a couple of key areas and maybe a couple of gaps. Um, the panel really put uh, an emphasis on the importance of competition. Um, there was some discussion earlier about, uh, with Mr. Drabkin, about whether the federal government actually is doing less competition than it was. I agree with him based on the research that we did that the percentage of competition has, has, has been relatively consistent. However, the, the panel looked at what best commercial practice was for competition and determined that the government's competitive practices didn't, didn't really measure up. Uh, we didn't have any good data on orders under um, large IDIQ, multiple award contracts, um, and about a third of the uh, contracts awarded under the data we did have were awarded non-competitively. The private sector does much better uh, particularly in services and IT procurements than that. 
Um, and we still don't today have good data on the amount of competition that is actually used in uh, awarding orders under task and delivery order contracts. Um, and that, that's something that needs to be corrected uh, very soon. Uh, the, our panel expressed very strong views on the need for greater emphasis on requirements development and acquisition planning. And I think, I still believe that's a gap. Um, you, you see uh, this, this thread in the presidential memorandum and in the discussion of cost reimbursement contracting about uh, may, maybe restrictions on cost reimbursement contracting, but in order to make this system work to reduce costs, whether you're using cost type contracts or whether to make it possible to use more fixed price contracts, the bottom of that is requirements development, and it's what the private sector spends their money on, and it's what the government needs to do a better job on. We, we made some suggestions about putting teeth in the requirements process, and those suggestions actually haven't been picked up yet, and I'd be more about them. Um, and as I said, a number of our competition uh, suggestions have been enacted, and they're in my testimony, and I won't go through them. Something else we proposed was much better management of interagency contracts, and Section 865 of the 2009 NDAA picks up on that. Um, with respect to the workforce, um, again, we recognize that there was a significant mismatch between the demands on the workforce and the, the skills and competence. I was looking at the same executive order I think Ms. Manos was looking at, the implementation of FASA um, just last week, and I was struck by the President's emphasis in that, President Clinton's emphasis in that memo of cutting 275,000 federal, federal jobs. And uh, obviously there's recovery here that, that needs to take place with respect to the workforce. Um, it's not just numbers, and I won't go through them, but if you look in the panel's report, one of the things that you'll see, and I think this is a gap, is that we recommended a consistent definition of the federal workforce and consistent measurement and also a, a single database for the federal work acquisition workforce so we can tell what the federal acquisition workforce is. There's at least three different counts that are used today and they produce wildly varying numbers. So uh, it's not only numbers, it's, it's a definition, it's also getting the skills and the competencies correct as Mr. Assad testified. Um, I'd be happy to respond also regarding uh, blended workforce issues. Uh, the panel, I think, was the first to point out some of the complications associated there. And I would like to make one final observation to the, to the committee. Um, our, as I said, our panel was focused on giving the, the government the, the tools to do a better job, make wise decisions. But there appears to have been developing in the last two years what may be piling on to enact the latest sort of investigative uh, provision. And many of these are overlapping, they're burdensome, and they really intrude on the ability of the government to manage its business. And I'd like to encourage the subcommittee to undertake a review of these provisions and to assess where there is duplication and what the collective burden is that these provisions impose on the workforce. Do we really need three new whistleblower provisions that do the same thing? Um, should contractors who make a mandatory disclosure under the mandatory disclosure also be subject to a key TAM suit? Uh, for making that disclosure. There's a lot of overlap here, and I think it would be worth looking at whether, whether it's imp need, needed to check that and make some rationalization to uh, it. Just Thank keep you. in mind, all the panelists, this is a work in progress. Right. Right. We have all of your written statements, and we will look at your recommendations in a very sincere way. Uh, Mr. Amy, you may proceed. Oh, thank you for inviting me to testify, and I hope to meet your deadline here. I am the general counsel of the Project on Government Oversight, also known as POGO. Throughout its 28-year 20 20 history, POGO has worked to remedy waste, fraud, and abuse in government spending in order to achieve a more effective, accountable, open, and ethical federal government. POGO has a keen interest in government contracting matters, and I'm pleased to share my abbreviated thoughts with you this morning. Uh, many contracting experts and government officials have blamed the inadequate size and training of the acquisition workforce for today's contracting problems. The work for, workforce reductions are, are a major problem, but we believe additional problems deserve equal attention. These problems are inadequate competition, deficient accountability, lack of transparency, and risky contracting vehicles, including some that have already been mentioned today, sole source contracts, commercial item contracts, cost reimbursement contracts, and time and material uh, labor hour contracts. Um, in, in, 
be as abbreviated as I can. I just want to provide you with one example that kind of hits all four of those subject areas. And in my full testimony, I provide 22 recommendations that we think can be implemented to help improve the contracting process. But this is a 2006 IG report from the Department of Defense on a commercial contract for non-competitive spare parts. It was an $860 million contract. And this is just the abbreviated results section. The Air Force negotiating team used questionable commercial item determination that exempted the contractor, I won't name them because I don't want to you know, call them out on this, it's an pr internal problem, but from the requirement of submitting cost or pricing data on a $860 million commercial item contract for non-competitive spare parts used by the department's weapon system. As a result, the Air Force negotiating team classified basically all contractors non-competitive spare parts as exempt items. It goes on to conclude that contractor refused to negotiate catalog prices for commercial items based on price analyses of previous cost-based prices, refused to provide DLA contracting officers with uncertified cost or pricing data for commercial catalog items, and terminated government access to the contractor's cost history system. When Ranking Member Bilbrey opened the opening remarks and using, it, using the term an adversarial system, I think it goes past what's going on necessarily between offices and offices within the federal government. But this is also a problem with the government. The government doesn't have the tools necessary to get fair and reasonable prices in certain circumstances. Thank you again for having and allowing me to testify. I'm more than happy to work with the subcommittee and the full committee as we proceed. I want to thank all of you for your testimony, and we'll now move to the question period. I'll start it off, and then I will recognize our ranking member, uh, Mr. Bilbright. Uh, in response to the comments offered uh, from our first panel, are there particular issues discussed that you believe deserve specific emphasis or added amendments? And let's start with uh, Mr. Gormley, please. And then we'll move down the panel. Yes, the, uh, in regards to resources, if I had time, I was going to go through my, go by, but resources is the key here. Uh, I listened to Dave Drapkin. Uh, we uh, interface with uh, GSA quite often through the Association Coalition, and uh, they have a tremendous number of vacancies there that for some reason the, the L process takes quite a long time to bring folks into government. Uh, three weeks ago, I had the opportunity to, uh, to go and visit the um, VA Acquisition Academy up in Frederick, Maryland. I don't know if you're aware of that or not, but VA has, has stood up a VA Acquisition Academy. It's a three-year program. Uh, there was about 27 interns in this program, and I thought that, uh, that I, I think the committee would, be, would do well by taking a trip up there or getting a chance to go over the committee. It would be a very good opportunity for you all to see some of the excitement in the acquisition field, and VA is a leader in that. Mr. Bond? Uh, yes, I, I wanted, uh, I think, to draw attention to one of the subcommittee members, and that was Mr. Connolly, who uh, brings a really unique combination of experience as a leader in both government and uh, at a leading contracting company. And I would hope that the subcommittee, the committee, indeed all of Congress, would use him as a valuable sounding board. And secondly, Mr. Bilbray really, I think, uh, hit a key point that bears a lot of thought, and that is how to attract, retain uh, younger workers, making sure they have the modern tools. Government wrestled for a long time with how to deal with email. How can you communicate with people outside the government? Is it personal? Is it business? We need the same thing for the social networking, other web 2.0 technologies. Mm -hmm. That uh, I was at a construction user roundtable meeting the other day, and a lot of the big design, engineering, procurement companies are having a lot of layoffs these days. And the fellow, the procurement guy that was there from DOD and recruited a lot of people for his workforce there for the construction project management program. So there's some, there's some workforce availability and train people uh, transferring over to the government now. In terms of um, broader issues, we think some of our contracting reforms would raise the level of competition and the type of performers that come into your construction programs. And we think ultimately that would help the agencies. Madam Chair, I would like to, um, to suggest that, that one thing that DOD could do a much better job of, uh, Mr. Shea mentioned, for example, using the Defense Contract Management Agency as their cost analysis group. I think it would send a much stronger message. They've currently gone from having a three-star flag officer or general officer in charge of the Defense Contract Management Agency to having a civilian 
the message that sends to DOD is that we don't care about this. This is a backwater. It's not where we're going to put our best and brightest people, is to restore that so it's a three-star or four-star billet and to show that you really do care about government contracting and the Defense Contract Management Agency is exactly where we need really bright people to be working. Uh, two two aspects of the, of the testimony this morning struck me. Uh, obviously, the need to augment the acquisition workforce. Uh, that is, that is uh, whatever tools, whatever regulations you have in place, you cannot replace people with regulation. And so that is a, a key requirement that definitely needs emphasis. And then the second was uh, Mr. Drapkin and, and Mr. Assad both mentioned the um, need to adhere rigorously to requirements. And that, whether you have a cost reimbursement contract or a fixed price contract, getting the requirements development process right is critical to that. And so uh, to the, there are efforts in, on, in way to, to ensure that that is done, and those are efforts that should continue. Thank you. Um, two things. Uh, one, I'd like to echo requirements. I think those of us who've worked in this area for a long time realize that there's a lot of talk about it, but there is a real skill set that's involved in doing it right. And it may need some encouragement from the committee some, and the subcommittee and some help to the agencies to understand that that's a priority and they need to put resources, technical resources, at that issue. The second one is we didn't get a chance to talk about inherently governmental. There's going to be an effort underway per section 321 of the 09 NDAA and the President's memorandum to define what's inherently governmental. And if you look at the panel's report, I think we were concerned that that not be a one-size-fit-all endeavor, but rather the agencies be allowed to define what is their core mission and where they need the people and to make reasonable discretionary choices about where to contract and where to bring, bring work in-house. Thank you. Ms. Jamie. And I agree with my uh, panelists. I would also say as far as increasing competition, we would look, should look at debundling contracts. These multiple services and multiple goods all compounded into one contract is problematic. That will not only increase competition, but it will also remove this layer of subcontracting that we're seeing where we're down the three layers, four layers in the contracting world. I'd also like to see better tools uh, in acquisition workforce's hands as far as cost or pricing data to make better pre-award and post-award decisions, and also enhancing USA spending. I know there was some talk with Mr. Drapkin this morning about databases that are out there, but we are, we're starting to see Congress create databases, and POGO was behind one for the responsibility and performance database, but we, now we have an excluded parties list, we have USA spending, that we need to somehow consolidate those into like a one-stop shop for federal contracting where you can get all information for me members of the acquisition workforce as well as the public. Thank you. I'd like now to yield to our ranking member, Mr. Bilbert. Yes, Madam Chair. Um, you know, sort of reflect your last comment about the bundling, you know, in the um, the nonprofit contracts that were let in Afghanistan, we found that not only were they bundled, but then the winner of the bid went back and negotiated with the competitors that they had beaten for doing the subcontract work. And it ended up, you know, that, that's something we'll have to look into. And I guess, Mr. Bonnier, um, I, I appreciate you um, uh, identifying some of the challenges we have. I remember getting here in 95 as a uh, and uh, coming from local government in California, and we're both Californians, so we we'll try not to flaunt this too much, especially at the state our, our state is in right now. But uh, I was just blown out that you couldn't email between congressional offices at a time that buckets of ice were being delivered to our offices, you know, 50 years after the invention of refrigeration, and we were burning coal to generate the power for this facility. I mean, in California, you go to prison for burning coal, but that was a whole <laughs> culture shock. I, I guess um, one of the things I want to get um, identify is some of these challenges that, that we arrange in our, um, our procedures. Uh, the parts issue is one of those things that sort of hits me. I was, um, ran the, the trolley system for San Diego. And we had to negotiate for parts with Siemens Duvac. Now, you've got to go to Siemens Duvac to get parts for Siemens Duvac, at least most of the time. And the challenge we had was how do you competitively negotiate with a company that, you know, has a monopoly on the parts that you need to operate? 
And I guess the, the innovative way we did in government was that we ordered so many cars, took a look at the parts, and basically a lot of times the sales of the hardware is the lost leader and, and the parts department is where these guys make their, their money. We ended up doing is figuring out we're going to order more cars than we needed and then um, ask them how much assembly cost, ask them to deduct, deduct the cost of assembly and just send us the, uh, the, the cars unassembled. Uh, now that's the kind of thing that you've got to do when you've got a monopoly, but how often does a government bureaucracy able to do that? And so the, the challenge there, as I would ask you, is that when we talk about these things like the parts, um, what kind of innovative approaches can we go when we, we look at that? Or can we look at the fact that when we buy the units and we go out to a bid, and let me clarify, there was a comment about local government doesn't have to operate at a certain level. Uh, all I know in California, we're required to take the lowest responsible bid. And so there is the preference given to the lowest bidder, but then you disqualify those who are not responsible bidders and then move up the chain. At least there's a process you follow there rather than a wish list of, oh, well, this guy's got it. Um, so as we go these challenges, how do we integrate into our system, and I guess this is where the new young hotshots can pull up um, IT information to be able to look at not just the unit price, but also the, the, um, the life expectancy maintenance cost because parts are then included into that life cycle cost. Do we have the technology and do we have the process to be able to integrate that in when a bid comes in? Did I get too far out in left field on this one? Go I, ahead. I think basically what, yeah, what you're uh, approaching on there is the it's life cycle cost. And to one of the man, uh, panel members' earlier comments, there is an art to this. And I think the, uh, regardless of the age of the contracting officer, um, there is someone does need time to understand the government's needs, what the life cycle is, and need to understand the industry they're buying from. And so it's not uh, point, click, and buy here. And I think the uh, I think the the need to have a growing workforce and, and for Congress to continue to support the acquisition community, such as today, is fantastic. The government needs this kind of oversight and action to come out of this committee. But on the other hand, the government has barriers up in the per, in OPM to bring these people in. But to your point, it's life cycle costing. The government back in the 80s was very high on life cycle costing, and in some cases, gotten away from it. To your point. I think implicit in your question, too, is whether or not we have the ability to tap all these different databases and pull them together in an intelligent way so you can make a decision. The answer to that is yes, uh, with a caveat, that the federal government is uh, the largest enterprise that, that we know of in terms of uh, business function, larger than any private company. And so the task would be, would be vast if you were going to try to encompass the entire federal government and every aspect of it in that. But pulling multiple databases together into a, what is usually called a business intelligence module at the top so you can see what's going on and compare roll-up costs and so forth, that, that is done in private and uh, public sector settings today. Well, it's done, you know, I, I guess I shouldn't say this, but the fact is, is um, one of the big determining factors of the success of Toyota was, yeah, has been at least a perception that the life cycle cost of owning this vehicle is much lower than vehicles that people have been um, familiar with. Uh, basically, much lower cost, much longer lifespan, and everything else. So the initial cost uh, was not the issue that we had before. It used to be that imports were cheaper to buy up front, but overall, and what happened was Toyota um, totally destroyed that perception. And all at once it became the deal, here's a car you buy and you drive until, you know, until your grandma and pass it on to your grandchildren. Uh, that that is may not be reality, but it's a perception that has really driven the success of the Toyota model, and that's one of those formulas that consumers make all the time. But does the the bureaucracy have the ability to do that? And do we have the incentive to do it? That's always a tough part about when we talk about the comparison between the private sector and its inherent efficiency, as opposed to the the public sector, is that vested interest in the decision making. If I might, um, so Toyota in that case has created real value, and so in the government contracting 
setting, I think the, the fact that you can look for the best value is, is uh, somewhat corresponding to that concern. Um, I think that uh, you talked about whether or not we have the incentive, and I think there that the subcommittee might think about some creative approaches, and we'd love to engage with staff and members on that. Uh, but one, one uh, disincentive that you have right now is kind of the uh, use it or lose it spending pattern with the, the uh, annual appropriations and so forth. There is no real incentive to, uh, to save some money on a really high value so that you might then use that for something else. Uh, it may be a cross-cutting initiative, for instance, one idea we'd suggest that if you really save some money on something because you uh, went the extra mile and got the best value, you can use that saved money. It doesn't die. You can use it on cross-cutting uh, federal uh, agency initiatives, or it perhaps could go into extraordinary compensation for really good contracting officers. A really good contracting officer in the private sector, if they executed a multi-billion dollar successful contract, which then anybody in the public sector would realize. You know, it's funny you say that, Mr. Bond, because I, my father passed away when I was a sophomore in high school, but I always remember, he was a life, a lifer, Mustang in the Navy, and he always says communism would never work, eventually it would fail, but his explanation was because countries don't have fantails to throw the hams overboard as you come into port. <laughs> um, and that based on the old concept that if it was, it was in your inventory when you got into port, you didn't, you didn't get that the next time out. And I guess you really hit on there is that's inherently a challenge we have in the public sector that we've got to figure out how to address, and I, and I appreciate that. And I think it's one of those things that we need to go back, and I yield back, Madam Chair. Because of time, I want to uh, thank all the witnesses. We have your statements, but we're going to mail out to you a series of questions, and we'll try to categorize them with your background of experience in mind. And we would appreciate the answers back, if you can, within 10 days. Uh, we will be suggesting to the full committee certain policy changes, and I think the kind of testimony that you have offered today will be very, very helpful. So uh, if you will answer, we have a series of questions that will keep us here to 3 o'clock this afternoon, but we can't do that. So I would appreciate you responding to us within uh, three, 10 days of receipt of the questions. And thank you very much. And this uh, panel may be relieved and the meeting is adjourned.